Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim. And you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! What's up? What is up? Welcome back to the Talk House Podcast. It's your boy, Elia Einhorn. And joining me to intro today's show from the Windy City... It's Josh Modell, and technically, I'm in Milwaukee today. Ah, the man has moved an hour north. Yep, Brew City, you can call it if you'd like. Beer and cheese, baby. That's two delicious things. Well, Josh, we have a delicious show for the listeners today, one that I've been really excited to share. Phil Elvram of the Microphones and Mount Erie in conversation with Mira. They're like the beer and cheese of the Pacific Northwest. (laughs) Well... We had to put these two together. There's two projects that are both dropping within a week of each other. Two really incredible records. One is the 20th anniversary reissue of Mira's debut full length, You Think It's Like This, But Really It's Like This, and a new album from The Microphones called The Microphones in 2020. It's the first release under that name for Elvram in over a decade. And Josh, these two go way back. Mira was once a member of The Microphones, and over the decades... It's strange to say decades, but it's true. The pair have been frequent collaborators. Phil's recorded and produced several Mira joints, including You Think It's Like This. And he also appears on this very cool tribute LP that accompanies the remastered reissue. In my day, we would have called that a bonus disc, but I don't know if there's a disc anymore. Yeah, I don't know if there's a disc anymore, although I will definitely be buying the vinyl issue of this one. This is special. Some of the artists that came on board to reimagine... Mira's iconic first record, Half Waif, The Fantastic Ila Bamba, The Blow. And a couple of Talkhouse regulars, Jen Wozner of Y Oak, Shamir, and Mal Blum, all on there. I think we have similar taste. Yeah, this is such a celebration of Mira's early music. And, you know, it's been so awesome to watch her over the years. She's released five solo full lengths, a few collaborative albums. And after making her name in the amazing Olympia scene of the 90s, moved out to Brooklyn. Josh, from that first record that we're celebrating today, let's listen to the track of Pressure. Is this a really that original version is absolutely amazing, but Josh, what about Phil's cover version? Also essential. Let's hear a little bit of that. It's just gorgeous, both of them. I actually think he took a little bit of a microphone's approach to that as opposed to Mount Erie. (laughs) You may be right. You may be splitting hairs. I think Phil is known kind of (laughs) equally for those two bands over the years, of course. Recorded as the microphones for a long time, starting in the 90s. Changed his name over to Mount Erie for a while, made a bunch of records there, including one I think that you and I have talked about as being really special, right? Yeah, man. I mean, you know, both of those projects have such special albums. I think the one you're referring to is A Crow Looked at Me. That was released under the Mount Erie moniker in 2017 and was written in the aftermath of this really tragic early death from cancer of his partner, the illustrator Jean-Vievre Castre. Yeah, that's it's an incredibly powerful record. Uh, you know, I think... It's one kind of entree into his catalog along with The Glow Part 2 from the 90s, which is, uh, you know, a fantastic record and and kind of interesting, very different looks at the kind of music Elvrum can make. Josh, I can't tell you how long I looked for The Glow on vinyl and how much I paid for it once I found (laughs) it, but it was well worth the time and money. It's really an incredible record. And now, uh, surprising everyone last year, as you'll hear in the talk, Elvrum played a show as The Microphones, and now he's recorded another album as The Microphones called, strangely enough, The Microphones in 2020. But it's a different kind of album. This is not the usual set of songs that Phil shares with the world. This is one song for the whole album. It was recorded between May of last year and May of this year. And uh, I I understand it's about 45 minutes long. It's one 45-minute song, kind of meta about the history of Phil's life and career as the microphones, basically. It ventures into, and I I mean this in the best way, kind of Mark Kozlik of late territory, where it's like, 
much more autobiographical and very detailed and really weird. Like the dude is still surprising us all these years later. He really is, Josh. And I mean, I'll tell you, the confluence of these two records at the same time is just such a beautiful look back and look at what is happening right now. So, I mean, this talk is just the analog to that. There's some fantastic memories of the incredible Olympia Washington music scene from the 90s. That, of course, was fueled by K Records, Kill Rockstars, Dub Narcotic Studios. Yeah, some of which they get into here. And, and it's proof that these two are really lifers. They're here for the music. They're doing it because they have to. And through thick and thin, they're making incredible boundary-pushing music. Yeah, and you know, in addition to that, look back at the scene that we get in this talk, we get to hear about why Phil is recording as the microphones again, what that means. Yeah, we get a great story about metaphorically as well as literally carrying your own trash around with you. <laughs> Yes. And of course, something that we all miss quite a bit, the joy of the merch table. Yes. Not just the transactions, but the hugs as well. Should we roll it? Yeah, man. Let's hear it. Hi, Mira. Hi, Phil. This is really such a treat because even though we do keep in touch, we don't really see each other. No, we haven't Zoomed. We have not Zoomed since Zooming became the way that friends yeah. see each other. Ugh. It's nice to see you. Yeah, you too. Are you at your farm now? The stone wall? Yeah, yeah. I'm in wow. the pond house. Yes, I'm not it's in a beautiful. cave. It's <laughs> beautiful. I'm at the pond house. It was so long ago I was there. I don't remember the pond house exactly. Did you come here twice or? Yeah, probably twice. It was probably 2001. Yeah. One? Yeah. Yeah. Uh Uh-oh, we're starting off in that way that I was worried that the conversation would be, which is highlighting what a terrible memory I have. Well, because that's kind of our theme for this conversation is uh, our terrible memories. (laughs) Misremembering (laughs) the past. In case anyone ever listens to this podcast that we're (laughs) currently recording, should we like explain what we're talking about? Yeah, so Mira, you have a reissue of... (laughs) You think it's like this, but really it's like this Mm -hmm. from 2000, the year 2000, 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Yeah. Is it remastered? Yeah. So the original album is remastered and it comes as a double LP or double album if you're, even if you're not getting the long playing. LP is like Um, industry lingo for (laughs) album. Yeah. And yeah, there are cup, it, I'm, I'm like, is it, are they called tribute? Tri- is it a tribute album? Is it a covers album? Um, oh, interesting. I, I like tribute. And well, <laughs> I, you know, I'm like very uncomfortable with any of the language around. Um, I, I kind of refuse to use the word fans. Mm. You use customers. <laughs> I, well, do you remember? Clients. It was pointed out to me a long time ago by a friend that, well, fan is actually short for fanatic. And, <laughs> you know, I'm curious. Maybe the dictionary definition of fanatic does not have any um, negative connotation. But in my mind, the word fanatic is not really a positive thing. It's a little um, unhinged, yeah. Yeah, unhinged, perhaps. But, um but actually, I think the real reason why I'm uncomfortable with that language is because, I don't know, I feel like insecure or like shy, bashful, mm-hmm. or unworthy, you know, uh-huh. all of those sorts of things about like, oh, me, attention, me? like attention on fans. me, uncomfortable with attention, all of these uh-huh. things. So, so yeah, when, when the, the phrase tribute album came up, I was like, ugh. Uh. <laughs> it sounds like that. But yeah, every track on the original album was covered by a different artist. And you did one that was the first single that got released. And it was such a cool experience for me, really. I have to say, after having this experience of like having my first record covered track by track by all these different artists, I would recommend it to anyone because of how I was able to listen to my own songwriting and hear things, just just hear them as songs separate from myself. 
separate from mm-hmm. my my own voice singing them. Like you could see so, how they worked maybe. Yeah, and it was super interesting. And I mean, the tracks are so great and they're very, very um, varied. So they're mm-hmm. like all really different from each other. And mm-hmm. and a lot of them are quite different from the originals. And yeah, I, it, was a, it was a good experience for me. Yeah, it seems good. It mm-hmm. seems appealing and scary, like ego death. Uh-huh. Seems really <laughs> useful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always useful to take steps to have perspective on whatever is accessible of a, of an outside perspective on yourself or your work. And it's yeah. almost impossible to do is that's the tricky thing. Um, mm-hmm. And so this was like the surprise way that, that ended up doing that for me. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. It's funny that our two projects that we have happening at the same time synced up how they I do. I think, do they have the same release date even? Almost. Maybe? I think mine is yeah. the 31st. What is yours? Oh, okay. Mine's August 7th. They're a week apart. Yeah. So. And they're both sort of looking backwards in a yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. So mine is one song that's a whole album long, length song. Mm-hmm. And it it's a new Microphones album. And Microphones is... I'm telling you this like you don't know, but it's because we have eavesdroppers. (laughs) A whole bunch of them. My old band name that I didn't use, I haven't used since like 2003. And then I just decided to see what it meant to like make another thing with that name. And like poke around at that question of the significance of names and what it means to look backwards and... (sighs) It was like a, a protest a little bit. It's like an anti-nostalgia album. How is it anti-nostalgia if, it, if the subject is really looking back? And- because I want to look back and then I want to arrive at a place, like process the past and arrive at a place where I'm liberated from it and uh-huh. I'm free to like live in this new present moment. Yeah. I realized it wasn't like the intention when I started working on this long thing, but... I realize now that that is what's useful and not embarrassing about nostalgia. Uh-huh. Or, you know, it's like actually really good to do. Is so it worked. Ex- it, that, it I, th- did I think that so. For you. Well, for me, I'm still like kind of in the midst of it. And mm-hmm. especially during this quarantine, I've been doing lots of archiving organization mm-hmm. and working on lots of just going through my parents' attic and getting yeah. rid of stuff and deciding what is significant and what's not. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe that work will never end, but it's been feeling good. Well, I guess as the piles continue, now you get to go through 20 years ago, but mm-hmm. in 10 years. Yeah, I'll accumulate more. Well, maybe not. It's not. Yeah. You could, we, we can choose to. I used yeah, to save a lot helps. more things. When I, I was I remember a kid, when you carried around your garbage? <laughs> I think about that project a lot. I I think everyone should do that for Yeah. But did was it for a it wasn't a day, was it a week? Couldn't it be? My a memory week? of it was that yeah, it was my memory of it was you carried all of the garbage you produced on your person for a week. Yeah, I had it like in a bag yeah. around my waist. It sounds really crazy now, but I do think it was a really instructive exercise and that everyone mm-hmm. should do it. Olympia. Other people did it with me. It wasn't just me. Oh, really? I thought I, it was just weird Mira. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in my mind, I had like a small community of weird friends who chose <laughs> to do mind. it at the same time. It, see, well, this is about, this is how my memory works. Maybe I make up details that... Um, oh, for sure. I have made up details in in my like autobiographical song that we're talking about. There are definitely things in there that I just sort of claim are true. <laughs> Did you like, in what, whatever your writing process was, you know, you sort of came out with some details and then realized that you weren't certain that those mm-hmm. were true? Uh, no, I, I wrote about them like in the way that the memories have lived in my mind for all these years. And then I realize if I start to dig into the old like notebooks and journals yeah. and We'll try and line up dates and stuff. I'm like, ooh, maybe that tour was actually the year before. Uh-huh. But it kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. Really. I'm not, I'm not, I don't work for the IRS. It's, no. um. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, how how memory works and how yeah. how um, it's, it's it's poetry. Like, what do we add to memory later? Like these friends that I had yeah, who also wore lot. <laughs> wore their trash around their waist. I mean, maybe it was just me. <laughs> right. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Who knows? There's so little documentation. I'm realizing of of our. Five years in Olympia. I lived there for five years. I well, I was there for ten years total. Be, although that's because I went. I was there for school starting in ninety two, and I and you didn't get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was after I I had graduated. I got there in ninety seven. That's right. <laughs> Nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, my feeling about like looking back and going through the archives for my organization processes, but also for yeah. writing this song has been like, oh, there's mm-hmm. so little information compared to how how much I remember and how yeah. like the things that came out of that time, the albums we made or like the show posters or the tours we did. People didn't have video cameras in their pockets. But at least we made records. I mean, the, our... Oh, I'm so glad yeah. that people didn't have video cameras in their pockets. <laughs> I feel like you wouldn't have carried around your garbage for a week if uh, yeah, you had the internet. Like, look, how much <laughs> how much trash does a person produce in a week, or something? Yeah, you would just like write a blog post about it or something. Yeah, the the difference between holding memories of a time before there was incessant documentation and holding memories now during a time where there's just like so many photos and videos every day that all of us are making, it's not even possible to, to archive those. So then it just ends up, or for, for me, I mean, I'm not good at media management. That is definitely a true thing. Maybe some people who take tons of photos and little phone videos all the time, every night they like go through those and put them in folders. And then do, does anyone do that? Probably, but the question just becomes why? Like, right. why? What are or we trying where, to... Or where do, where do they live and where is your mind's eye? Uh-huh. If when we have so, so many digital, like this sort of overflowing digital archive that's completely disorganized, mm-hmm. where's the space for the mind's eye? Mm-hmm. Which is not to say that I have a very accurate mind's eye from the time before the overflowing digital archive. But there's something that's sort of relaxing about the dreamlike quality of, you know, telling the story and being like, oh yeah, and then we did. Mm -hmm. Right. I prefer that. It might not hold up in court, but that's not what we're doing. Listening to your new song... And listening to all the details, it was so interesting for me to listen to it and have this feeling of, I mean, I know you, you're my friend. You've been my friend since back then, since all these experiences that you were talking about in the song. But I didn't know about some of those Hmm. experiences. And I also, even though we're friends, it's not like you always are really forthcoming about your <laughs> interior world. Um, That's true. <laughs> except, except in your songs. Right, which are usually maybe more obtuse. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm, and I'm then, not giving like dates and Right, and this names. one was um, very specific and, well, it made me really wonder what I'd actually love to talk to someone who who doesn't know you just so we could sort of compare those experiences and also talk to other friends of ours who have listened just to be like, do you remember that? Or how, like, huh. where does that fall in your memory palace of life? You mean people who are there but aren't, both. haven't maintained, connect- yeah, okay. I meant both, yeah. Because I, ha- I had such a, both a feeling of, connection to you and sort of bringing up my own memories of that time and of our, you know, our experiences together as friends and collaborators, but, but also this feeling of like, there's so much to everyone we know that we don't know. And usually Mm -hmm. we never know it. 
unless our friend is a person who makes a 45 minute song of really specific memories and then shares it with the world. And then it's I suppose both, so. It's both like, I know you and I don't know you. And <sighs> hearing and hearing the song reminds me of that in all good ways. All of it. But feels don't you good. feel like like re- regular, not 45 minute long songs, songs that are not specifically autobiographical, don't you feel that way about those as well? I always have. I like yeah, hearing I your songs and be like, ah, I guess Mira uh, has this going on? I'm like, uh-huh. I, we can read into each other's poetry yeah, on all levels. I, with this microphones thing, I just tr- made an effort to get really explicit. <laughs> Which is cool. It was, it was inspiring to me to like, oh yeah, I would like to spend some time with my own memories and like t- try to dig in a little further than usually surface. Um, mm-hmm. Like, I mean, especially right now with... Ara having this little kid around, my brain is constantly interrupted. It's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's amazing. I love it. It's wonderful. And it's kind of like having (laughs) like a little electric shock in my brain that goes off every, um, that goes off very frequently that sort of obliterates my thought process. I actually think having a kid is a big part of what's like propelled me into looking backwards because mm. seeing this child mm-hmm. who's now five. Yeah. Oh my God, she's five. Living with her and like watching her memories being formed. Yeah. Watching her life experience from scratch. Yeah. And it, it, it gives a really not abstract picture of, of my own five-year-oldness yeah. and everything beyond. And so looking into old photo albums feels different now than it used to. Because huh. it's, I can see her being 42 years old. Uh-huh. And uh, plus, plus like Genevieve dying and, uh, and yeah. going through like the remnants of her things and like her, the memories that we carry of her. Yeah. It's all very not abstract, like the way that layers of history pile on. Well, and the, the physical embodiment of Genevieve right. that's yeah. in the gut. I experience that just in the small amount of time that I've gotten to spend with a gut. But mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, people say that, but I don't, I'm maybe too close to be able to have that perspective. Yeah. She's just her own person. Yeah. But yeah, I, I see the resemblance, I, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Music is, I would say, 10% of what I do <clears throat> on a day to day level. Like, you know, as a parent, like mostly what I do is spaghetti. But. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I mean, you have continued to record and release a lot more music. I mean, I'm at I'm 19 months in to this baby mm-hmm. situation, and you're five years in. But you've always been like mm, about 200 percent more productive than me. I've got a pretty crazy work ethic. And I think maybe actually the deprivation of personal time because of single parenting um, makes me more efficient with the little windows of time I do have. It's true. I'm more desperate to work on my stuff. So I don't, I don't fuck around too much when I do have time to do it. Well, but you know what, that just like goes right along with what I always saw and experienced of your work ethic to to begin with. So or in a way, it's sort of like, it's not surprising to me that you maximize your small windows for the work that you need to do. I mean, I was always slow and now I'm still slow, which I, maybe I could pick a different word or have like less weight on it. I it's, think I make it kind quality of doesn't matter. things. Yeah, you make quality <laughs> things. It takes however long it takes. That's... I do remember you saying a long time ago, um, maybe related to a conversation like this, like about sort of your output compared to mine, um, musical output, and that you were like, yeah, but you don't have any filler. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that like there's anything on your albums that's like it's all filler. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, I guess I re- I do pack it in, but it takes me a while. Yeah, you're like making diamonds 
by yeah by just like Slow. clenching them for <laughs> centuries. <laughs> it's the Virgo way. Well, yeah, I, I presumed that that's still your way, even mm-hmm. though we haven't made a record together in many years. I remember, well, I never actually thought of you as slow. You would come to the studio and be like, I have this thing yeah, and, and this thing and this thing. Or you were gone on tour for a week. I recorded this song and this song on my four track. And he, recently, part of my going through the archives, been finding these amazing cassettes from you um, oh. that you would give me of four track recordings when uh-huh. I was gone. So good. And yeah, he, that's that not was- slow. You were just... You would have like spurts of creativity. Well, I was, that was my 20s also. Uh And I put out, you think it's like this advisory committee and come on miracle all within three years, I think. Yeah. And well, that was also during that era where Dub Narcotics Studio was like a block away from each of our houses. It was so amazing. And still, I would sprint. That block, that one block, I, I would run from my house, from the track house to the studio or skateboard too, just to get there a little bit faster. Yeah. And then when we were in the studio, skateboarding from the control room to the drum set. It was a big room. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. it's, this is an urgent thing. Life yeah. is short. We have to record these albums and um, we'll all be dead soon before we know it. So... It was so fun. I mean, how cool was that? It's just a really nice feeling to remember the big room being there. And it was right between our houses. Like you were one block away. Maybe I was two blocks away, but it was right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And um, it was such a special time. It was, yeah. It it really was. It truly was. I'm so wary of like over romanticizing the past (laughs) because... But it was. It was, it was like empirically, objectively a very special time. I think we even knew it at the time. The weird stuff we would, our like small group of friends would do just for no real reason. These creative ideas. Yep. And the big room for listeners is what Mira <laughs> calls Dub Narcotic Studio. Lots of people mm-hmm. called it that because it was a big room, like a big, huge... Giant. ...warehouse space with windows on all sides with like mm-hmm. a bunch of recording equipment that Calvin set up in the middle of the room with... Z- zero sound isolation anywhere, even from yeah. the seagulls Yeah, outside. seagulls nesting on the roof and traffic, and it was perfect. It was a great studio, and it was just kind of open to us... Calvin was very generous with very, um, very generous giving us the space and the resources to make our weird projects in there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was for me, it was 97 to 2002 when I moved away from Olympia, although I would come back frequently and still yeah. keep recording there. But there's something special about all of us living within a few blocks and yeah. not having cell phones or computers or TVs, I think was a big part of it. See, come on, it was a special time. Listen to you. (laughs) It it totally was. No, it totally was. I'm just listing all the ways that it was special. And the the degree to which we were allowed to be like so deeply engaged with whatever our creative project was. For you Uh and I, it was usually music, but for other friends of ours, it was making clothing or letterpress printing or painting or sculptures. It's kind of like there were no... Like somehow our lives didn't have barriers to like, literally we had the key to this studio, a key to that studio. And like you had a car, but none of the rest of us needed cars because we were all within a couple blocks of each other and all the studios and um, and everything was free. (laughs) Somehow everything was so cheap or free. Yeah. My rent I think was 175 a month. Yep. And... Yeah, I volunteer at the co-op for some free blackberries all food. summer long. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Those were the days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This show is brought to you by Patreon, who ask creators, are you tired of being paid in clicks and likes? Social media and streaming platforms help people find your work, but getting you paid is another story. 
With Patreon, you can stop rolling the dice of ad revenue and per stream payouts and grow your creative career through the direct support of the people who care the most, your fans. Since Patreon is built for creators, not advertisers, you'll skip the middleman and develop a sustainable income source by offering a monthly membership to your fans. In turn, they'll get access to exclusive community, premium content, and the chance to become active participants in the work they love. The creative system is broken. So if you're a podcaster, video maker, musician, writer, illustrator, a creative person of any kind, sign up on patreon.com now. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. And change the way your creativity is valued by building the steady income stream you deserve. I, we were in our 20s. I was you were just, tw- just barely I in was your younger. 20s. Yeah, yeah, I was 19 to 23. Yeah. 24. It's funny. Actually, it's been um, because of the, the reissue and spending this time thinking about, you know, 20 years ago, it's this really solid chunk and then putting a number on it of my of my age at the time, and also looking at looking through the pictures, um, some of the ones that we were sending back and forth, but other ones as I was going through my own box of photos from that time, and like just me trying to relate to being I was I was I think twenty four or twenty five when you think it's like this came out. And in a way that actually sounds older to me than, um, than I, than I felt, I felt like a kid or now when I think about a 24 or 25 year old, I think, oh, like, you know, responsible young adult (laughs) in the world. (laughs) I I wasn't irresponsible then. Well, yeah, I think they, I think they are, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I meant, I said that sarcastically, but I meant it. Okay. Got it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's like slightly dysphoric for me to think of myself at the, like 24 and 25, like barely having a job. I mean, I, like I worked at a coffee shop and then. You delivered nut milk. And then I, until I decided to run a cafe out of my apartment and that's what, that's what my income was. Yeah. You know, unless we went on tour and I made some some money. Yeah, but, we're um, all just hustling. Hustling, it, like in, in the version of hustling that like everything is like tiny and made of sparkly stuff. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> hustling <laughs> by like selling organic nut milk door to door. Yeah, for example. But No one's going to get, only our friends are going to get that reference. Mira had a small <laughs> business for a while that was um, Beak. It was called Beak, and it was a proprietary the, blend of blended nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah, it was subscription-based. Sold in glass bottles. Yep. Yeah. It was not a very lucrative business, I will say that definitively. I feel like it's probably all the rage nowadays, people doing that kind of totally. hustling. If I was still scrappy. doing it, I'd have ads, like, on all the buses in New York City. Yeah. Instead of like oat milk or whatever. Well, not too late. Not too late. I feel like we could keep doing this for 10 hours. We could yeah. keep drifting between the past and the present and talking about what was it really like. And But I'm interested in talking about like what does it mean? Did we already address that enough? Like. Like what? It, like what does it mean to us now? Yeah, what does it mean to us now for you to decide to make this reissue and this tribute album? And <laughs> what does it mean for? And my my looking back project is sort of different from yours because I took a different mm-hmm. tack and tried mm-hmm. to, I don't know, undermine the act mm-hmm. of looking back or, or redefine it or something. I mean, I do hear what you're saying. And especially as compared to mine, mine is like super traditional, like it's like a celebration, like I made this mm-hmm. thing and and now we're like sort of bringing it out again, mm-hmm. you know, with some a new like hat on. Mm-hmm. 
And yours is... Um, Mine's more like, like, I made some stuff 20 years ago. Get over it. Here's... <laughs> <laughs> get into the present. That makes it sound like there's some fuck you in it or no, like, there's or no fuck, fuck off. It. But, it, but I don't hear that in it at no, all. No, okay. that isn't... I didn't put it the right way. What is the thing I made? I actually, yeah, I wanted to write an autobiograph autobiography of that time. I wanted yeah. to explain what quote unquote the microphones means. What yeah. w- what how it came to be, what the ingredients were that made me during those years. Yeah. And I wanted to evoke it. I wanted to evoke my life in this utopian world that you and I are talking about of Olympia pr- just pre-internet or yeah. early and, internet. and from from your perspective now. And from my perspective. And you know, having experienced right. Well, yeah. So the song the- ends with me now and and wanting to hold that, hold the reality of that and the layers of that that are still in me. Like I'm still mm-hmm. me. I was there and I'm here. Mm-hmm. It's both. And so, yeah. yeah, it's a song about like all of us walking around containing all of these layers mm-hmm. and how they are always composting with each other into. Yeah. At every moment as we accumulate more layers. The song started, I don't think I said this, but last summer we put on another festival in Anacortes, a What the Heck Fest. And it was a very simple one day sort of reenactment of the, our 2003 festival. Yeah. And so I looked at the lineup from 2003 and basically chose the same lineup and the microphones were on it. So I was mm-hmm. like, okay, well, I'll just play as the microphones. No big deal. But there was some like music press that came out around like, ooh, a mi- new microphones show. Phil's playing mm-hmm. a microphone. What's going on here? <laughs> and I, that, I didn't, hadn't considered that that would happen. And it was like weird and kind of annoying and silly to me. Mm-hmm. But that's what started this whole thing of like me mm-hmm. being like, what, what is a microphone show? Why does it mean anything? And what, what is stepping back into the past and what's it for? Well, the okay, so the interesting thing is when we were having some memories about the big room and, you know, telling our story, oh, you lived a block away and it was so great. And you had a bit of like, you had a cautionary moment <laughs> of like, oh, it wasn't all, it wasn't all that great. <laughs> but that, like that moment of you stepping into our conversation is... Basically, when everyone has this sort of maybe foggy, slightly foggy nostalgia that will turn certain certain moments of the past into a rosier memory than mm-hmm. they may have been with all the jagged edges left on. Mm-hmm. And I think that our music, it ends up being the soundtrack to... People's and I'm sure you've heard this from people who listen to your music, who we could call fans or not. Um, I call them clients. <laughs> clients, um, you hear this from people that it like the the music holds that place in time for them in a way, and so maybe it's sort of like returning to the music or returning to the idea of the microphones. And what that meant for some people, Mm -hmm. you know, if they like shoot through that portal back into their past without the jagged edges, people want that. I know they do. And and I do too. Like I do too. Have you seen any reunited bands playing at large summer music festivals that are bands that you loved when you were younger? Because if you want that, like you can have that. That's in the past decade, that's been a big thing. And I've found it a little distasteful or like I, I'm, I'm apprehensive about it. Uh-huh. I've seen some good, sh- like I saw Stereo Lab recently. Oh, you you mentioned that. Or did, it was so good. Was that good. in your song? I did, did talk about in Stereo Lab in my song, but <laughs> I'm like, was that a I talked about a different had, time. Or did I just in the see that song, in your we're video? talking about seeing them a long time ago, but I saw them last year or something, and it was uh-huh. so good. But yeah, I've also seen some bands that I treasure their albums, and then seeing them at a huge beer sponsored festival, uh, it kind of ruins it for me. And it's like the whole cash grab feeling 
but uh, I mean, yeah. The, a beer sponsored festival in general. That's pro- it's that's hard to have a good experience for, there. For me and it sounds like you too. It's not really the go to for landing back in that feeling. No, but still, I feel like that type of sh- band reuniting thing typically in in our time and in our reality, mm-hmm. that's that's how it feels. I mean, both of us share this that we're I mean, I've had the same band name the whole time, mm-hmm. um, which I always kind of wanted to change, but then it's my name. <laughs> and after everything started, it felt awkward to ever like really try to change it. But it's just, you know, mine's just me and yours is just you. So we could be, I did go see Stevie Nicks um, mm-hmm. uh, maybe two years ago. She was wonderful. She told mm-hmm. so many stories. I mean, mm-hmm. she sounded great and it's fun to listen to the songs, but the real pleasure of the concert was the stories that she told. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it wasn't like couched in a whole stadium show and it wasn't like, wasn't like the band playing all the hits. It was like this person who I admire sharing stories about her life. Um, Yeah. She's like currently doing her thing. It's yeah. not a. It's not touching on nostalgia or reenactment. Yeah. I don't know. It's fine. I, I shouldn't talk too judgmentally or dismissively about that because I don't. It's just not for me. It's not something that has appealed to me as an artist, and I don't blame mm-hmm. anyone for doing that. And it's just not um, appealing to me. Is well, how I should put it. Okay, but here, this is a sort of subject. I mean. Talking about performing, that is not something that's happening right now for mm-hmm. you or me or anyone. And I, I think about it a lot and I have a lot of feelings about it. And like, I mean, Todd was showing me the other night this, um, it was a YouTube video of this public school in, on Staten Island. I think it's PS22. And there's this, um, choir director for the fifth grade class who... They sing in Bjork. Oh, you've seen it. I saw that video. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay. And it's totally beautiful. And the kids are amazing singers. And we watched a couple of the different videos, which are, it's all a different group of kids every year because it's just the fifth graders at the school. But I just started crying because not just because it sounded really good and sometimes when things sound good, I cry, but the experience of singing together with other people, Mm. that specifically is something Mm -hmm. that's not happening worldwide. Worldwide, Mm -hmm. humans are not allowed to sing together in a group right now. Mm -hmm. Fifth graders, old people, you know, community choirs, like bands, indie bands, big, whatever. We can't do that. And, and I think about like, you know, all like theater performers and I'm not even a person, like I stopped touring like extensively several years ago. I, I think I would only tour like total of six weeks out of the year. I'm sure like over the, you know, in, in the last couple of years. So it's not like, every single day feels changed for me, but a lot of people, you know, like theater actors, they, they do a show every single day and Mm -hmm. the feeling of exchange with an audience, that energy, that's this mutual experience and that that is not happening right now. I know this was a big pivot, but I've been thinking about that a lot. Is that something Mm. that you've been thinking about? Not so much. People ask me how I'm doing. Is it okay? Did I have to cancel tours and stuff? Mm-hmm. And I did. I had to cancel a four, three or four tours. Yeah. But I'm kind of okay with it. I love touring and I miss it and I hope I get to go back to it someday. Mm-hmm. I specifically hope I get to bring my daughter around the world and like give yeah. her that type of life. I, I've yeah. loved as stressful and complicated as it is, I love traveling with her. Yeah. But as an artist, like the artistic part of performing in front of people has always been a, a little, 
it's not been like the center of where my heart is as an artist. I, I want yeah. to, I like doing it, but it's not my main thing. I mostly like engaging with people. I mean, I could say the same thing about myself too. I think like I, I identify more as a songwriter and recording artist than a performer. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm kind of just a shy person. I have a hammy side, but like (laughs) it doesn't always emerge when I am sort of in the spotlight. You know what I do really miss is the merch table. Yeah. (laughs) Not the money of it, but just like the... Interactions. Yeah. I I loved doing that job. I've... I view myself as a record label because I I love putting out my own records and like setting them up on a table and selling them from my box that came out of my car to Mm -hmm. a person's hand for like cash. It's so (laughs) simple and direct. It's like in in the weird way that we somehow try and make this music thing into money and like support and livelihood for us. It's the least abstract version of that. And I love it so much. And so... So yeah. for now, I just have to sell records on my website, which is also fun, but... It's, it's, it's not quite the same. There, there aren't any the hugs. Um, There's not a, like a germ exchange happening, <laughs> which I miss. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's, it's just a big shift. Yeah, I think someday we'll get back to it. I hope to get back to playing like the grossest... L- Basement shows, <laughs> 15 people sleeping under a piece of carpet with a cinder block for a pillow and getting like $4 in gas money. Ah, uh, yes, I remember it well. I miss it. <laughs> Do you remember the time that we, that we, you got us a show on Prince Edward Island? I was just going to say, I was, do you remember the time you fought that guy? Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Because, yeah. And what it was like, they thought that they had hired a band that was just going to like play all night and play a bunch of covers. When yeah, did you t- we when, were not entertaining Just curious, wh- how did you get, what did you say when you set up the show? Did you indicate that at all? No, I didn't indicate it. I but I was so excited and desperate to like get any show I could in Charlottetown, PEI. That yeah. So it was like up, an upstairs restaurant or something. Yep, I remember. <laughs> and uh, I think as soon as they said yes, I just went with that. Yeah. A good job going in there and demanding, would you get $20 or something? Well, I, what I did was it, was, it was enough money to cover the bridge toll. Is, right. Because yeah. that, because I was really hung up on the fact that like we came over the bridge to PEI, and it's like a thirty dollar bridge toll, and I was like, we are not leaving this island without having our bridge toll covered by this club owner. He was also trying to get us to pay him money because he had rented a PA. I think he was trying to get us to pay him seventy dollars or something for for him being out the PA rental, and. I mean, to be fair, not, yeah, he shouldn't have done that. But like, if <laughs> if I was running a restaurant and people were out in their like small town trying to have a nice Friday night and eat dinner with their friends and family and some like mm-hmm. little skinny dork from Olympia, Washington came <laughs> with an unmiked acoustic guitar with like five strings on it. It was like, yeah. oh, excuse me, pay attention to me. I wrote this song about the ocean and the moon uh, yeah <laughs> and you were playing a little air organ maybe with with me yeah it it was yeah were we likely candidates right to be venue. demanded money no. from i don't think so well that but also we just weren't entertaining for um Aww. a bar and grill we weren't the right band no. no you nailed it we that was not we were not the performers for that audience it's countless, though, the amount of shows that you and I have both played like that. Yeah, I know. And is it weird to miss it? Is it weird to feel, like, nostalgic about wanting to be, like, in the struggle again of that? No, I mean, you know, before COVID and, like, having to cancel everything for who knows how long, I mean, m- much of the last decade, I would say... After I started working with 
a booking agent and also just sort of like being able to play larger shows and feeling like, oh, it's actually helpful to have this help to set things up. And I'm not sure if I have the capacity to book my own tours anymore. And I would like to have some whatever, like <laughs> uh, olives in the green room or whatever I put on my <laughs> writer. Um, but I have many times in the past 10 years felt like, oh, I miss the, I miss, like, remember when we played in Manasquan, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and that high school kid set up the show and- Andrew. Andrew, and his parents made us dinner. <laughs> yeah. And I think, and we slept, we slept over at the, at his house, at his parents' mm -hmm. house. And the show happened at like the, some like community center, mm -hmm. Grange Hall type place. Mm -hmm. And there was barely anybody there. And, but it was super sweet. It and was I, ideal, and, yeah. And and actually, he tried to give us his own money because yeah. not a lot of people showed up. Yeah. And he felt bad and wanted us to be able to have, you know, not go away empty handed or mostly empty handed. And he tried to like, like get this cash from under his mattress and hand it to us. And we were like, no way, your parents made us yeah. dinner. Like what? I also miss interactions like that from having, from working with a booking agent and playing more comfortable shows. That's mm -hmm. the trade off. I, yeah. I always fantasize that there's a way to have it both ways. Ah, oh, I wish there was. But I haven't yeah, figured it it's out. It's like two different business models. One yeah. of them has money in it and the other one has no money but like <laughs> I know. but um like punk idealism <laughs> I know but just like our nostalgic moment about Olympia that like you know part of what was beautiful about that whole time is that it wasn't commerce based and none of our exchanges with each other were I mean man Phil I probably owe you a lot of money if we were going to like yeah, transfer our currency. Yeah, probably owe you lots current. of money too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we all, like everyone in Olympia at that time, all like all the projects we were doing, like yeah, we all just did everything for for free, and our cost of living was really low, and so it, somehow it all worked out. But like that allowed for a more sort of like limber social exchange. Right. Yeah. Because money and compensation was removed from yeah. it. It freed us up to just do our thing. Yeah. It's a dangerous, yeah, this may be like a whole other conversation and I have to go pick up the kid oh, yeah. in a sec. But um, yeah, boy, that conversation about punk idealism and oh, yeah. money. Oh, that's very big. That's a big we one. Need, yeah. More, th <laughs> more than another hour even. Maybe... Talk House starts like a second podcast series. Yeah. For, for, <laughs> Called for the rest of the conversation. The, the and dream it's is like over. 10 hours. Yeah. <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah. Mira, it was so cool bumping into you here at the Starbucks. It, it's, <laughs> what are the odds? It was. No, okay, Especially okay. since you love coffee so much. Oh, I'm dead without my coffee. <laughs> Um, Need that bean. Phil, it was so nice to see you and be with you for an hour. I don't think that we have spent this long in conversation for years. Like maybe not since we went on tour together last, which is so long ago. It's true. It's super nice. I, I truly feel like we could keep going for 12 more hours. Yeah. Let's go on tour sometime. Yeah. If we're ever allowed we'll to again. It. We could just do this in the van. Yeah. Sounds good. Whole new podcast. Phil Elvram, Mira, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. That was so special. Josh, I just absolutely adore that Phil remembers Andrew from Minasqua, New Jersey's name <laughs> all these years later. Uh, it's pretty incredible. Listeners, definitely make sure to jump right into You Think It's Like This, But Really It's Like This and The Microphones in 2020. This may be a fucking horrible year, Josh, but at least the music is fantastic. That's true. That's true. So we'll get something good out of it before we all die. <laughs> yeah. I want to give a quick heads up to those of us who don't follow us on socials. You should be. We are doing a lot of dope stuff outside of the live shows that we're used to doing most years. Just this last week, we paired Perfume Genius with Jeremy O'Harris. 
the brilliant writer behind Slave Play, as well as the artist Shepard Ferry in conversation with Paul Banks of Interpol and Muzz. You can check those out on our Instagram at TalkHouse. That's live on our IGTV. And podcast episodes of those talks will be forthcoming. Really incredible conversations have been happening here and people are se- seem so excited to talk to each other, just like uh, Mira and Phil did in this talk. Everyone that we heard talk today recorded themselves from our hashtag Stay Home Studios. Thanks all. And our producer extraordinaire is Mark Yoshizumi. The researcher for today's episode was Reese Higgins. The TalkHouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. Make sure to subscribe wherever fine podcasts are served for upcoming talks like Deerhoof with Wadada Leo Smith, James Mercer of The Shins with Bruce Hornsby, and Bob Mould with Bullies Alicia Bagnano. Till next week, I'm Ellie Einhorn. I'm Josh Modell. Peace and good music in 2020. What's up? This is Phil Elvin from the yeah. microphones. You're listening to KWJX Talk House 97.7 X, the max. Wait, is that really? Where did, where did you get all those numbers from? Those letters from? 